tuning in. Um, so welcome everyone as you begin to arrive. Um, thank you for joining another Friends from the Field webinar. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, if you're just arriving, feel free to put your name, where you're from, and um, a favorite thing about mushrooms into our chat box. This um, series is co-hosted by Blue Hill Heritage Trust, a community conservation organization for the Blue Hill Peninsula, and Island Heritage Trust, a land trust for Deer Isle, Stonington, and the surrounding islands. My name is Lander, and I am the outreach coordinator for Blue Hill Heritage Trust. And today we have Tenley, the land steward for Island Heritage Trust, here with us. Um, Jake is on vacation for those of you returning and who have been with us before on these webinars. Um, and as I mentioned before as well, this will be recorded and you will get a link um, in a follow-up email and it will also appear on our websites if you want to share it with friends. Um, I also just, I always love to say thank you so much to our communities for helping us provide these free programs. Um, we, we are always so grateful for generous support. Um, and if you enjoy our programs and would like to help us continue to make them free to the public, um, feel free to check out our websites. Um, both Blue Heritage Trust and Island Heritage Trust have places where you can do that. So I think I'm gonna pass it over to Tenley for a moment for a little bit of technology housekeeping, and then I will introduce our speaker for tonight. Hi everyone, I'm Tenley. Um, as Lander said, I'm um, the land steward at, at Island Heritage Trust, and I'm doing my best to, um, to sit in for um, Jake McCarty. Um, who's uh, the normal anchor from, from IHT. Um, he's on a well-deserved vacation right now. So um, just a little bit of um, intro about, about tech issues. Um, if, if you have questions, um, as um, David um, gives his presentation, you can type them into the chat box. And then at the end of the presentation, we're gonna take 10 to 15 minutes and um, we'll, um, Lander and I will read out the questions. If you'd like to ask your question live, you can um, raise your hand at the end of, um, of the presentation and Lander can give you the ability to, to speak um, or turn on your, your audio is that, or video. Is that correct, Lander? Yes, oftentimes we just um, will turn on the audio, but if, if you like the video as well, I think we can do that. Cool. Yeah, and thank, thank you so much to everyone who's joined us. Thank you so much, Tenley. Um, thank you so much, David, for being here with us tonight. We're super, super excited to have you. Um, and for those of you who, who don't know David, I think many of you do, um, but he is a retired um, teacher from the University of Georgia. He moved to Brooklyn, Maine 14 years ago. Um, and before the pandemic has led forays and offered classes with Blue Hill Heritage Trust and Island Heritage Trust, College of the Atlantic and Eagle Hill. So we are very lucky to have you here tonight um, to share your expertise with us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lander and uh, Tenley. And thanks to uh, both Island Heritage Trust and the Blue Hill Heritage Trust for all of the great uh, conservation work that they do. It's a, it's a real treat to get out on the trails that they maintain in this area and that they've made uh, available to the public, particularly for those of us who are interested in mushrooms and and seeing and foraging for mushrooms uh, in in Maine. I want to start out in this uh, program uh, uh, wishing everyone a happy mushroom season. Right here in the Blue Hill Peninsula area, it's pretty dry. We've had a very dry summer and then a couple of weeks ago there was a bit of rain and, and all the mushrooms decided it was time to uh, pop up and uh, we had a pretty good uh, brief mushroom uh, uh, blooming, but uh, more recently it's dried again and there's not much rain predicted in the future. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of an odd season. I wanna start my talk with these two uh, images on the uh, first uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, slide here. And that is that the, the uh, image on the left is uh, a chanterelle, something that uh, you, you're probably very familiar with uh, and many of you have probably collected and eaten and enjoyed. The image on the left is something that we that did come out late this year and uh, it comes out quite regularly this year. It's, it's not the good part of the mushroom in Maine, mushrooms in Maine, but the bad part, although it's also a beautiful part because this is a jack-o'-lantern mushroom, Omphalotus illudens, 
And uh, it's a poisonous mushroom, and in fact is the cause of many of the poisoning cases that are reported in Maine. Here, for example, are a comparison of uh, chanterelles and jack-o'-lantern mushrooms in the, uh, in the field. The jack-o'-lanterns frequently grow in great clusters, unlike the chanterelles, and will uh, grow uh, often on a wood substrate, a old uh, tree root or a tree stump, as you see here, this picture that Jeannie Yarbo took. And then close up, the chanterelles have these um, remarkable uh, funnel-shaped uh, fruiting bodies, and the jack-o'-lanterns look very similar, but there's a slight color difference. But the amazing thing about them is, as I mentioned, that they are bioluminescent. And here is an example of some jack-o'-lanterns, Ampelotus illudens is the scientific name, taken um, with the ambient light. And this uh, photo on the, uh, on the right is one taken by a, an expert uh, mushroom photographer, Taylor Lockwood, whose books some of you may be familiar with. And uh, it's taken by the light of the uh, Ampelotus, the jack-o'-lantern, the light that's uh, produced uh, by the gills themselves. It's often fun if you do find some uh, Omphilotus, the uh, jack-o'-lantern, to collect them, put them in a plastic bag and uh, put them by your uh, bedside table at night. And uh, when you wake up uh, with bad nightmares to look over at the bedside table and uh, see these things glowing in this plastic bag, it's really, it's really pretty stunning to see. You do need to dark adapt them and you do need to dark adapt your eyes and to see them. So you don't have to wait to the middle of the night. You can take your mushrooms into a dark closet and wait about five minutes and see the same sort of, uh, sort of light show. <laughs> it's interesting that uh, over the past uh, couple of decades that mushrooms have become much more popular in our uh, North American uh, culture and uh, we call this a transition from mycophobia, the fear and, uh, uh, of mushrooms, to mycophilia, and that is an interest and a desire and a love of mushrooms. And this, this love in recent years has included people's interest in foraging, such as uh, this uh, collected uh, maitake, this Grifola frondosa, and uh, in, into cooking, the collected edible mushrooms. Here's some maitake that I cooked at Eagle Hill uh, last summer. Um, to an interest in forest ecology, to understanding what mushrooms do in the, uh, in the uh, forests around us and how they're important in the forests. Um, to medicinal mushrooms, if you go online and look for medicinal mushrooms, there are hundreds of different uh, mushroom uh, powders and mushroom extracts and mushroom uh, um, lotion, potions and lotions that are available online. Uh, this is one of the same maitake that is cooked here and collected here. And this maitake um, produced by um, uh, Paul Stamets and his Fungi Perfecti uh, uh, organization is, uh, would cost you about uh, $30 or so, whereas uh, um, the same amount you could make about you know, a, a, a pound or so of these same things, just collecting them in the wild here. Um, but some people like having uh, medicinals that have a name on them. Also, people are much more interested now in cultivating mushrooms. And here's a log with shiitake mushrooms growing on it that uh, I started uh, several years ago. Um, and Certainly nature photography is something that I'm interested in and that uh, I hope I can share with you in this presentation. That interest in mushroom uh, biology and mushroom activities is also, is also uh, reflected in various publications that are uh, out now and that um, include uh, Paul Stamets' Mycelium Running. Paul Stamets is one of those who has really done a great deal to popularize um, mushroom uh, uh, study mushroom activity, what mushrooms do. His, uh, his uh, um, TED talk that, he's, that he presented called uh, Six Ways or Seven Ways That Mushrooms are, Can Save the World is based on this book of his, Mycelium Running. There's also a lot of books out now by, tra uh, by uh, um, writers who are interested in 
in mushroom cultivation. And mushroom cultivation is quite a simple process. And uh, I'll show you some of that a little bit later. Trad Cotter's book is one such example. And just mushroom popular writing by authors like Greg Marley, a local uh, uh, Maine uh, author, is, uh, is similarly uh, a, a very popular uh, outlook, for out, a very popular uh, outlet for uh, mushroom uh, information. Paul Vol Volleben's uh, book, The Hidden Life of Trees, talks about uh, how mushrooms uh, help trees communicate with one another. And a very recent book by Merlin Sheldrake, The Entangled Life, is, is another example, just published this year, about how um, fungi, as he says, make our world, change our minds, and shape our futures. He's a fascinating writer from England. And finally, I want to mention Michael Pollan's book um, about psychedelics and how psychedelic mushrooms have become um, very interesting to not only people who are uh, enjoying the uh, trips, but uh, for um, medical reasons that uh, in fact, uh, psychedelics are very effective in uh, helping to overcome addictions, depression, and um, various aspects of consciousness, including mortality. So um, there's lots of other books. And in fact, um, I have uh, supplied to Landair um, a list of uh, field guides and uh, publications of mycological interest that uh, she will make available to you when the recording goes out um, for of this, uh, of this talk later on. So what are mushrooms anyway? Well, as all of you probably are well aware, mushrooms are fungi, fungi being a large group of uh, organisms, not either, neither plants, nor animals, nor algae, nor anything else. We'll talk about what they are exactly as, as I proceed here. Fungi are extremely diverse and very numerous. There are perhaps 100,000 species of mushrooms that have been described uh, so far in the literature. And it has estimated that this is just the tip of the iceberg, that there are probably 5 million total number of species. Most of these, um, in fact, are very likely microfungi, very microscopic fungi. And, and for today's talk, not of great interest, other than the fact that they are, that they are fungi. Um, there are probably 14,000 or more named species of mushroom fungi, a oh, tremendous number of uh, within the fungi. In our region, there are documented more than 3,000 species. And people often ask me why I can't identify everything that they hand me. Well, not only is it ignorance, but it's also because it's almost impossible to know that many different uh, different organisms in of a particular category. And I s indicate here that if you compare it to the number of tree species there are in Maine, for instance, which number perhaps 75 or so, it gives you an idea of the extent of uh, diversity that exists in this and, uh, uh, and, and uh, numbers that exist in this group of, of organisms. But fungi include more things than just mushrooms. So fungi do include, do include mushroom-like fungi and the true fungi here, but they're also um, fungal-like organisms, the water molds as, uh, ex as uh, indicated in this uh, picture in the upper right. And there are also th things that some people think of fungal-like such as the slime molds of which you see a growing plasmodium here and the uh, sporangia, the reproductive structures on the right-hand side here. We won't cover those at all today, <laughs> but I do wanna indicate that on the Tree of Life uh, in a publication dating to 2003, um, it's interesting to note that the fungi on the Tree of Life, this being a branched a diagram indicating relationships between organisms, the fungi and the animals are rather closely related in the big picture of things. The slime molds by comparison are on a separate branch and the water molds that I showed you a picture of in the previous slide are way over here on a completely different branch. Uh, these other 
branches uh, indicated by different colors are different uh, primarily protozoa-like organisms, but over here we have plants and algae and uh, other things that are maybe a little more familiar with us, uh, familiar to us. So how do we define, or what are the characteristics of fungi? Um, well, there are three things primarily that we have that are characteristics of fungi. The first is that they reproduce by spores. And here's a microscopic view of some fungal or mushroom spores. And they're, if you have the, a microscope and the right kind of a magnification, you can see a lot of really remarkable um, uh, uh, details and quite beautiful actually from the point of view of a mycologist <laughs> like myself. Um, to see these. Not only are they quite exquisite to look at and diverse as well as the, the mushrooms themselves, but also um, uh, are uh, really remarkable in the, in the different kinds of characteristics that even the individual spores have. They're very small. You need a high-powered microscope to see them. These spores typically grow uh, when they germinate into a um, branched filamentous um, network of, of, uh, of uh, filaments that we call a mycelium. And here is such a network of mycelium on top of and growing into some leaf litter um, from uh, the germination of spores, presumably. And this little cottony mass of white filaments in this case is what in fact is the growing active, if you will, the, the body of the, of the organisms that we call mushrooms. Um, these filaments feed themselves by secreting digestive enzymes and absorbing the, the food that is uh, broken down around them as they grow through the substrate. So that third characteristic then is that mushroom fungi are, um, are, are, um, are heterotrophic in that they require organic carbon to um, feed themselves, very much like animals. Okay, we need to go down to uh, um, Dunkin' Donuts and have a, have a donut or go to Burger King and have a, have a hamburger. The fungi also need organic material to feed themselves. They can't photosynthesize like plants. These spores that mushrooms make are made in the millions of numbers. So here's a, a little lawn mushroom, a satharella. You can see the underside of the caps are dark with all the spores that are being produced in these mature mushroom caps. Here is a microscopic view of one of these gills, one of these uh, plates in the mushroom. And the, here's the spores on the surface of that gill that as they mature, they are popped off and fall down out of the, um, out of the uh, mushroom and uh, can create in mass a spore print like this. If you take a cap of one of these uh, mushrooms and put it upside down on a piece of white paper in, a, in several hours or overnight, you'll have a spore print like this. You don't have to push on it. You just let the mushroom do all the work itself. The spores are released from the cap and fall down onto the, uh, onto the paper. It's a, it's a fun exercise to do, and there are many different colors of spores from white to pink to rusty brown to uh, purple to black uh, that are produced by different kinds of mushrooms. The mushroom spores, as I mentioned before, grow into this filamentous mycelium, the body of the mushroom, here seen in the laboratory in a petri dish where the spores were present in the middle of the petri dish and have grown out in a radial direction in all in all directions there. And here in leaf litter or in some rotting wood, we see that cottony filamentous uh, growing portion of the mushroom. And this is a little time lapse of mushrooms growing and branching. And uh, you can sort of be hypnotized by that. As the um, mushrooms grow and uh, continue to grow after a while, they'll use up their food or conditions will be appropriate for them to then produce their reproductive structures, the mushrooms themselves. The, the, in this case, 
The, the interesting thing about these pictures is that these are mushrooms that have been grown commercially and grown in artificial conditions. So in this big plastic bag here is uh, some uh, rye grain or wood chips that uh, this particular mushroom, a uh, hericium, has been uh, feeding on. And when holes are punched in the surface of the bag, the, uh, the uh, oxygen that is, or the air that is sensed by the mushroom mycelium in the bag itself grows out and within a couple of days produces these amazing uh, fruiting structures. And we can find these similar fruiting structures on birch trees and other uh, trees that are uh, in the woods around here. This is another one that's commercially grown. It's a uh, shiitake and grows from this block of uh, wood chips and, uh, and grain and produces these mushrooms um, in, under very, uh, under very spe specific conditions that are, uh, that are being uh, uh, followed by the uh, mushroom growers. The main thing that I wanted to show here is that the mushrooms themselves are just the uh, reproductive structure of the, of the organism. It's like the apple tree. The apples are, the, are roughly comparable to the mushrooms and the tree is the mycelium here in the, in the bag or in the wood, uh, in the log in the, or in the tree in the forest. You can, you can uh, enjoy watching this process go on if you buy a mushroom kit from someplace like North Spore in Portland or from Back to the Roots and similar company in the Bay Area and in California. And uh, after adding water to such a kit, you can then open up a side of the, of the box and within a couple of days, you'll get these little primordia produced. And, uh, and uh, within uh, four or five days, you get these uh, quite elegant mushrooms uh, produced from this little box of uh, mushroom mycelium. It's, it's a fun project. It's not, ne it's not necessarily cost effective, but because uh, <laughs> you pay $25 for one of these kits and you get about uh, four or $5 worth of mushrooms. Um, but it's fun to see how that process works. And in fact, if, you're, if, you're, um, <laughs> if you want to, sort of redo it, you can take that same box and strip it open and then just put it into some shredded paper or some other lignocellulosic substrate like, like I've done here and get another crop or two of mushrooms produced from the, uh, from the material that, that they're growing on as well. Sorry, I think that's my computer making in, um, impolite noises. The Mushroom that we're primarily interested in trying to identify is something that we need to uh, we need to look at the uh, the structure of the mushroom and uh, the structure is pretty simple of, of the fruiting body of any mushroom. There's of course a stalk or a stem, the cap, <coughs> and underneath the cap is a structures that produce the spores, in this case, the gills. On the stalk, there's a, uh, often a ring or a skirt that uh, in the development of the mushroom covers over the gills. And in some mushrooms, there's a, a sac or a vulva on the uh, underside, uh, on the base of the stalk that is often diagnostic. And it's particularly, these, these structures are particularly diagnostic of some of the deadly poisonous mushrooms like this uh, Ammonita bisporidra but the deadly destroying angel, which has toxins in it that will kill you if not, uh, 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 if you don't get a liver transplant or some other um, significant uh, intervention within a couple of days. So here you can see this uh, little cup on the underside of the uh, stalk in this uh, Ammonita here, the same structure that we see over here. Notice that it's underground or partly underground here. This is a little bit misleading right here because sometimes the ground level is way up here and you, if you're collecting a mushroom, it's often important to dig in underneath and make sure that you have all of the diagnostic uh, structures if you're going to uh, try to identify a mushroom. Other things about identifying mushrooms I've recorded here um, 
uh, so take a quick look at that. There'll be a quiz at the end of the uh, at the end of the talk. Um, actually, Landair will send out this list to everyone uh, with the uh, recording. I'm not going to go over that. It's basically characteristics that you need to um, be pay attention to if you're trying to identify a mushroom. <laughs> it's also very useful to have a photograph that is. Uh, if you will, a complete photograph of the mushroom that you're taking uh, a picture of for identification purposes. People will sometimes send me photographs and say, what is this? And they'll just have a little white circle on it with grass surrounding it. And I haven't a clue what it is um, or, a, or a little brown, brown thing because they're standing up and they're taking a photograph looking down on the ground um, and they don't <laughs> and they don't take time to, uh, and they don't take time to uh, be a little more diagnostic about the uh, photographs. So, for instance, in this Satharella, I've taken this photograph that shows the cap and the edge of the cap, and it shows the uh, stalk and some of the features like the ring around the stalk here. I pulled it up completely so we can see the base of the stalk, and I can see underneath the cap the uh, on these two the uh, gill structure and a suggestion of the spore color as well. And the same thing is true with this uh, horse mushroom. And notice that there are different stages of development here, that in the young stage, it's fairly white or light pink in the, on the gills, but becomes darker uh, in color as the spores mature. Um, it's also helpful to have some kind of a measure of the uh, size of the uh, of the mushroom that you're taking a picture of and unfortunately i rarely remember to do that but i did in this example and i put it in here to remind me to do that more often so i want to take some time now and go through the uh different types of mushrooms that there are um, and we're going to go through different categories. And the first category are the ascomycetes. These are the cup fungi, sometimes called, sometimes called the sac fungi. And there are two main types that are, exist that, that are large enough to be called mushrooms. And the one on the left is uh, orange peel mushroom. It's, it's one of the little cup fungi. And the one of, on the right is one of the more popular uh, edible mushrooms. It's one of the morels, of which unfortunately in Maine, we don't have very many. They come up in May, early May when they do, and uh, there just aren't the numbers of morels in Maine as there are in uh, the Midwestern states. The second and major group of mushroom fungi include such things that we're familiar with as the agarics with a stalk and a cap like this ammonita, but also things that are little brackets uh, like the turkey tail the, that we see here and right next to it on this log is this uh, tinder conch, uh, this Fomes uh, fomentarius. And the, the main categories that I want to mention to you, uh, just to indicate some of the diversity of uh, types of mushrooms that exist, not only in Maine, but worldwide, include the agarics, which are the gilled mushrooms uh, that, have, uh, that are fleshy and have a stalk and a cap. And in this case, it's, it's a, a witch's cap. This is a good time of year for a witch's cap, as well as a jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Um, br brilliant colors and uh, hard to miss in the in the mossy substrate where they're growing. Um, these are in a larger category. This particular mushroom is in a larger category called the wax caps, and you can almost get a sense of that waxy surface um, by looking at the the glistening uh, cap here and the wide spaced gills that are present in this uh, hygrosomy. But this is just a representative of the thousands of different guild mushrooms that exist. The second category are boletes, another group of fleshy fungi that are, have a stalk and a cap. But underneath the cap, um, it produces these tubes on the underside of the cap in a sponge-like um, tissue that, in which the spores are produced. And with the boletes in particular, staining characteristics, such as where I 
put my finger right here on the underside are often uh, diagnostic and it's always good to record those in the fresh specimens of any bolids that you collect to see if any staining occurs either on the stalk or the cap or the or the tube mouths as you see here. The polypores are a large group of uh, uh, often bracket fungi. In this case, the chicken of the woods is a good edible mushroom that we have, uh, that, that many people have uh, documented right now or in the last week or so in Maine. And uh, it has very fine pores on the undersurface of these multiple um, caps that are coming from a single place. Oftentimes a whole tree, a hardwood tree, <coughs> will be covered with these um, with these uh, orange, uh, um, with these orange uh, uh, mushroom caps, it doesn't have a stalk. The caps grow right out of the right out of the the, the substrate, the tree, or in this case, a downed log. Um, it's uh, for for many people, it's a good edible uh, mushroom, but for some people, they are sensitive to it. So, as in all cases, if you're foraging for mushrooms and you're unsure of whether something that is purportedly good edible mushroom is uh, going to affect you idiosyncratically in, in an in a uh, in an adverse way. You want to just try a little bit of it to begin with. Here's a beautiful photograph that was taken on Blue Hill Mountain by George Fields several years ago. I don't know if George is watching or whether whether uh, he remembers taking <laughs> this photograph, but I. I scarfed it up when Jim Dow sent it to me, and uh, and it's spectacular. This is a, just an example of a hericium, the, one of the tooth fungi. We'll see another one uh, later on, and and it's hard to describe um, other than as kind of a uh, a, a cascade of uh, icicles or something along that line. It's no, there's no mistaking it for just about anything else, and it's an, a a, a edible uh, mushroom as well. Often a very sweet uh, flavor to it. Coral fungi, um, including those that are branched and those like this clavulinopsis, which are unbranched um, and just produce a cluster of stalks, um, are uh, another category of um, mushrooms. The spores in coral fungi are produced all over the surface. So there's no gills or pores or tubes or anything like that, but the spores are produced right on the surface of the coral fungi. Um, it's hard to, hard to, uh, um, hard to uh, mistake uh, this clavulinopsis or golden spindles when you see it in the woods it's like a little campfire in, in, the, uh, in the woods. Perhaps in these days of forest fires, that's not a great, uh, that's not a great uh, um, thing to be looking forward to. The jelly fungi also produce spores on the surface of the mushrooms. And these jelly fungi like this uh, witch's butter, again, another seasonal name, are, um, are uh, Ha, are characterized by the texture that they have. It's a very gelatinous kind of uh, texture, as the name implies. Um, and many of the jelly fungi are used as f for food additives in soups and stews and things, particularly in, in Asian uh, uh, culinary dishes. Puffballs are another, the, the last category or almost the last category that I want to mention here. And here's a little uh, gem studded puffball. Some puffballs can be, grow to be the size of volleyballs. There's a giant puffball that uh, is uh, of that size category. Uh, this one happens to be in the category of beautiful mushrooms, I think, and, uh, and uh, has this rather spectacular ornamentation all over the surface. But you can see, comparing the size of these leaves on next to it, how, how small it is. Um, many puffballs are edible, but again, you need to be very be careful and, and know the characteristics that you're looking for. When you have a puffball, cut it open, and if it's white all the way through, then it's possible that it's, a, that it's an edible puffball. Um, if it's completely uh, without uh, structure on the inside if it's just pure white. 
There are a few other mushroom types that I want to mention here. There are puffball-like things called earth stars, where the outer peridium, the outer covering, peels away to give a star-like uh, appearance of the mature puffball. And then these delightful stink horns, it's, they're in the uh, order Phalales, and the genus is Phallus, uh, named by some mycologist with a sense of humor. Uh, and uh, they produce a rather smelly, um, uh, rather smelly collection of spores on the tips of these, uh, of these fruiting bodies that are, if not attractive to uh, humans, they're certainly attractive to flies, which come and gather them and strip the mushroom clear of spores within a matter, within a day or so. Another interesting small mushroom that's often overlooked in, but that comes up in vast numbers in wood chips and in, around gardens and things are the bird's nest fungi that do in fact look like a little nest, a cup with eggs where the spores are produced on the inside, these little peridioles, which are splashed out of these cups when the raindrops fall in them. And finally, I want to just mention truffles. This is not a photograph of anything here, but a, a French truffle um, that uh, grows underground. And um, why would a reproductive structure be formed underground? Well, it's, as you uh, appreciate, truffles have a very, they're very fragrant, have a very strong odor, and uh, they're discovered by rodents. And the, in the natural world, truffles are the major food for many rodents. In the Pacific Northwest, uh, flying squirrels and squirrels in general, um, their diet is almost 100% made up of truffles, if not black truffles like this one, some smaller, less uh, perhaps tasty to humans truffles that are present in the coniferous forests in, uh, in that part of the country, although we do have them here as well. So now I want to take some in the next few minutes to talk about uh, mushroom um, the ecology of mushroom fungi and how they make a living, I guess, is the best way to describe this. And there are three categories. Um, three is an easy number to remember. There are decomposers, though, that is those mushrooms which uh, break down uh, organic material and in some cases cause problems uh, in that process. But without decomposer mushrooms, it would be, we, we would have forests that would be uh, full of uh, sticks and logs and leaf litter and none of it would be decomposed without the, the intervention of, of fungi and particularly mushroom fungi. There are also parasites of trees and um, many mushrooms uh, produce a parasitic attack on trees and I'll show you an example of a, a little odd uh, a parasite as well. And there are perhaps ones that have gained the most uh, notoriety or the most uh, interest recently are symbiotic uh, mushrooms and that are cooperators in that they are able to help with another organism. For instance, uh, mycorrhizae are uh, cooperative uh, organisms with forest trees and uh, they're also um, symbiotic uh, mushrooms that are, um, that are farmed by uh, ants, for instance, and we'll look at those in a moment. So we, here are three examples of the mushroom, of mushroom mycelium that are, that are growing in leaf litter. And are decomposing the leaves that are in the, on the forest floor. Significantly here, Here's one that's just getting started. And here's a rope of mycelium that is transporting the, the body of the fungus from one place to another place. And you notice that when it, it almost looks like it's, it's a splatted onto the surface here. But what's happened is that when this uh, cord of mycelium hits the surface, the fungus senses that there's nutrients there and it spreads out into the into this radial pattern so that digestion of that substrate is, is easier. Wood decomposition is also uh, significant. Sometimes it's detrimental to human constructions. Sometimes it's quite colorful as in this spalting of this uh, uh, birch stump that you can see here. 
each one of these different patterns and each one of these different colors in this sawed off birch stump is an individual mushroom uh, growing in that stump, de trying to decompose it. And you notice the lines between these patches, there's little dense lines between them, it is a combat zone, if you will, between the individuals in this, uh, in this uh, stump so that we have two or three or four or more different, uh, different mushroom fungi that are, as it were, claiming and trying to claim and gain territory within this substrate, which is what they're trying to break down. And you were all probably familiar with the, the uh, artistic uh, um, end of uh, spalting, uh, as we see in that stump there, that we have in, that various wood turners take advantage of. And the same thing is true in this spalting in this maple bowl here. This is spalting, or wood turner wouldn't like to have it described as the beginning stage of rot, but that's what it is. There are also mushroom, now mushrooms that are parasitic, and certainly one of the better known ones and that's become quite popular these days is a parasite of birch trees called Chaga. The scientific name is Inonotus obliquus, and uh, Chaga is actually not a mush, not the reproductive structure of the mushroom, but is a is a resistant phase of the mushroom, and it looks totally unlike anything that we would describe as a mushroom. It looks like somebody took a blowtorch to a knot on the outside of a tree and created this charred um, knot on the outside. But that is, in fact, this uh, this particular mushroom, and this parasite, which is a heart rot parasite of the uh, of the birch tree actually has um, purported significant medicinal value um, and people make a, a, a hot water decoction out of it and uh, teas that are variously uh, uh, distributed and sold in various places. You can, you can find them from various local distributors as well. And if you're a chaga hunter, you can uh, sell your chaga for, I guess, up to $20 a pound in some cases. Uh, but I hate to advertise that because um, there are a lot of people who are, who are um, cutting chaga inappropriately, I think. It's being over-harvested. Another mushroom that's a parasite is a common mushroom that we'll see this time of year called the honey mushroom, uh, Armillaria austria. And uh, this is a, a mushroom that uh, is a root parasite of various hardwood trees and uh, will be found in great clusters around the, around the base of, of roots of, uh, of, uh, of hardwoods. Um, it's the mushroom that in fact is, has been suggested to be the largest individual organism in the world because there are clones of uh, honey mushrooms in the Pacific Northwest which cover 40 acres or you know, huge, huge amounts of territory. It's, a, it's an argument that uh, bears some uh, uh, examination. But there are also mushroom parasites that are parasites of mushrooms. Here's a little Asterophora, this little white mushroom in the middle here, that's growing on a, on a Russula or a Lactarius, I don't know which, another big mushroom as it's deteriorating or as it's uh, getting to be a certain age. And this mushroom is taking advantage of the host mushroom in its, in its decomposing state to be uh, attacked and then produce its own, produce its own uh, mushrooms. And another famous mushroom parasite is the uh, lobster mushroom, which is in fact a parasite of a, of a, uh, uh, a large mushroom by a smaller mushroom and is a choice edible mushroom itself. The combination is a choice edible mushroom. One of the interesting parasites that I want to bring to your attention is this uh, uh, Pleurotus, which is a good edible oyster mushroom. <coughs> you might think twice about eating uh, oyster mushrooms when you realize or learn that the mycelium, the filaments of the oyster mushroom growing in the substrate, this, uh, this wood block or in this, in this log that it's decomposing, produces little toxic droplets, these little dark spots that you see here, one of which is uh, enlarged here, um, are 
droplets of a toxin that paralyze nematodes, little microarthropods. These, this is a healthy nematode in figure four here. And number five is a paralyzed nematode that has consumed or come in contact with one of these droplets. And shortly thereafter, the mushroom mycelium grows into the, into the nematode and consumes it for dessert, I guess. Uh, the reason, in short order, for a mushroom growing on wood to, to have this attack on something that's rich in nitrogen is just that, that in fact the wood substrate is very high in carbon, um, but very low in nitrogen. And so this is a way that this particular mushroom can add to its, the nitrogen in its diet. Perhaps the most famous uh, interaction of mushroom fungi that we know about today that 30 years ago was, was simply not considered significant at all, is the symbiosis between trees and, and mushrooms. And this is called the mycorrhizal symbiosis. And mycorrhizae are um, a cooperative exchange between trees and the mushrooms. And that cooperative exchange is from the roots of the trees, which are feeding sugars to the growing mushroom mycelium, and the mushroom in its turn is contributing mineral nutrients, water, and even some potential protection from uh, soil parasites to the tree. And that connection occurs at these short uh, uh, branches off the tree root that you see diagrammed here and that you see here on this oak uh, root that I yanked out of the ground and uh, detached all of the mycelium. But what you can see are these little connection points, these so-called mycorrhizal root tips. Now, this particular diagram on the left here is really quite striking, and it's one that's been widely publicized and widely distributed. It's, it's one that shows mycorrhizal root tips on a pine seedling. Here's the pine seedling, and the roots of the pine are these brownish uh, um, structures that go in those three directions. And all of this white filamentous branched material is the mycelium of the symbiotic uh, mycorrhizal fungus that is associated with this, with this uh, tree seedling. The interesting thing here is that the tree seedling is not only, that, that this central tree seedling is not only connected to these filaments of mushrooms which are drawing in water, drawing in mineral nutrients, in a much larger area than just the roots of the tree, but also are connected to other smaller seedlings, this one here and this one over here, that are um, basically connected to the central one by this interaction of, by the filaments that are connecting the two, the mushroom filaments. And in this process, these um, trees can interconnect with one another so that a particular tree can um, communicate with other trees in its neighborhood, including seedlings of the same species um, or actually species, uh, different species, individuals of different species. And so we can think of this kind of exchange between species of trees facilitated by the ectomycorrhizal fungal network um, as being a cooperation, not just between the fungus um, that has these, uh, this mycorrhizal network and the tree that it's associated with, but also among the trees within a given area themselves, all interconnected by the ectomycorrhizal fungus. And that whole idea of um, mycorrhizal uh, networks in the forest are what have uh, uh, attracted a lot of attention in uh, popular writings like uh, Wolleben's uh, uh, writings about about trees, and that that uh, and that that uh, um, has made um, people very aware that forests are not necessarily trees in the forest are not necessarily in competition with each other, but may in fact through the fungal network be more cooperative, and that the whole community is one of cooperation rather than competition. Kind of flies in the face of some of the. Darwinian evolutionary dogma. 
A final symbiosis that I want to talk to you about, of which there are many, but this is one that, that's particularly curious, is an insect mushroom uh, symbiosis, leaf cutting ants uh, that are found not in the main, but are, are found in uh, Central and South America. Um, and here's a little ant that is, in fact, cutting a leaf. And uh, they take these leaf bits and transport them um, across along trails. If any of you have ever been to Panama or Costa Rica or done some ecotourism, you've probably seen these. Um, and they take these bits of uh, leaf material and put them into the nests underground chambers where they are cultivating mushrooms. So all this white fuzzy bit here is a mushroom fungus that is feeding on the leaf material that is coming into the nests of the leaf cutting ants. Leaf cutting ants don't eat leaves, they eat mushroom mycelium. And here is the food for the ants that has grown on this, com on this uh, composted uh, leaf material that the ants are providing. And the ants are very good at maintaining only one mushroom. Uh, we know that's not completely true, but primarily one mushroom fungus in these underground cavities um, and prevent them from making actually fruiting structures, the mushrooms, but eat, survive on the mycelium itself. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, example of basically insect agriculture these are ants that are doing a lot of work to maintain this, uh, this underground fungus. The last thing that I want to talk to you about is some recent innovations in uh, mycology, and we might call these a uh, mycofabrication or biofabrication using mycelium. And there are a number of different companies that are involved with this. Startups, if you're looking for a, a great mycological investment, something to do with all your money. Um, uh, Ecovative Designs is one such company, and they're using mycelium as a uh, as a uh, material that can be grown into various different shapes. So you can take a uh, take a container and inoculate it with the mushroom if you have a substrate like uh, wood chips or corn husk or agricultural waste of one sort or another and it's all bound together by the mycelium. And you can make, in this case, a little uh, insulated carrying case or packing case uh, for something. Uh, here you can make lampshades. Here you can make a beautiful chair <laughs> out, of, out of the mycelium of certain uh, mushrooms. And these, this is primarily things like uh, the, the uh, conks that grow on the sides of trees. That's the the mushroom material that this is made out of. And there, most rec more recently, and in fact, there was just an article in the New York Times yesterday about a company called <coughs> that's making leather-like substance out of uh, mushroom mycelium. And so these things that you see here are all made out of mushroom mycelium that have been grown in certain ways to give you a, a leather-like uh, texture, a flexible, water repellent, resistant material. The, and you could buy a very handsome a handbag here for uh, w when these companies get going, uh, made, out of, uh, made out of mushroom mycelium. Well, this kind of uh, activity of making things out of mushrooms, clothing out of mushrooms is not brand new because in fact, uh, in Romania, people have been making, people have been making uh, hats out of out of mushrooms for um, a long time. It's a it's a local craft that uh, that uh, uh, in the Carpathians in in Transylvania people have have uh, been making out of mushrooms. And the mushroom that's involved is right here behind me um, on this particular tree. It's Fomis fomentarius, and it's um, and it's uh, the the soft inner tissue of that mushroom that is stretched and wetted and made into this uh, leather-like fabric. <laughs> I want to end with uh, a couple of photographs of uh, what I think are some of the beautiful aspects of mycology. The first one is a bioluminescent mushroom, not the oyster mushroom, I mean, sorry, not the, uh, the uh, uh, jack-o'-lantern mushroom that we saw earlier, 
but to one that's called the bitter oyster mushroom. It's a very common one that we have in our woods around here. And this photograph taken by a COA student of mine of the mushroom taken with ambient light and the exact same mushroom taken with its own light is really quite striking. Another curious uh, sighting that you, you may uh, run across is some of these conchs, like this Fomatopsis panicola, red belted polypore, that produces uh, these amazing little droplets. They're jewel-like droplets on the undersurface as they're growing. I don't know why they do that or what the reason is. There's speculation about it. My neighbor, Dick Layton, took this spectacular photograph here on the, uh, on the lower right-hand side. Another one of the, uh, the uh, tooth fungi, remember I showed you that Hericium americanum that, uh, that George took uh, the photograph of. This is one that's <laughs> a, a good edible one. It, it has a stalk and a cap, but underneath the cap are these amazing uh, spines or teeth. And it almost looks like, I don't know, you're looking at the, at the fur on a polar bear or something. They're just spectacular in, in, their, in their structure and their appearance. And the Ganoderma varnished conch or reishi, another medicinal mushroom which we have around here, produces this remarkable varnished uh, texture on the surface of the mushroom um, <clears throat> as a natural part of its uh, growth and uh, development. Lycaria acupurpurea is a mushroom that is dazzling. But to, to see this amazing color of this lacaria, you have to pick the mushroom and turn it over or look underneath the cap. The cap is a pretty boring gray color. color uh, and it's only when you turn it over that you see this. Finally, I wanna end not with a main mushroom, but with a mushroom from my uh, uh, southern home, and that is Georgia. And here is a mushroom that reminds us that um, you never know where you might find a mushroom. This is not a setup. This is actually a mushroom that grows in the sand dunes right at the high tide line on the coast of Georgia. In fact, all the way up to the coast of Massachusetts, I've seen it. I haven't found it in Maine yet, although I've, I have looked. Um, so I wanted to uh, end the talk with just some of these surprising things and uh, I guess to open up for any questions that people might have, I think we do have a little time for questions. So thank you all for uh, bearing with me and uh, enjoy your mushroom foraging. Lander, I'll turn it over to you now. Ah, oh, thank you so much, David. That was incredible. And the, the you putting on the mushroom hat at the end was, it was oh. so wonderful. <laughs> Here, I can do that again. I enjoyed that. <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> we, we definitely have some questions that have been put into the chat box and we have at least one hand raised. Um, we can go over a few minutes past five if that works for, for both you and um, <laughs> Tenley, but we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. <laughs> so I'll start with the first one that popped up a little while up. ago. Um, somebody wants to clarify whether, um, so when it comes to poisonous mushrooms, do they need to be ingested to be poisonous? Um, simply handling them for identification won't be harmful from spores and dust, is that correct? That is that is correct. And in fact, I should have mentioned that, but uh, the, the viewer is, is absolutely right. That you can handle with your hands any poisonous mushroom, even the most deadly poisonous mushroom, the toxins are not absorbed by the skin and, uh, and uh, the, there's no danger um, unless, you're, uh, unless you have an allergy to, uh, to dust and spores and things like that. There's no normal allergy that you can get or, or toxicity that you can uh, achieve from the spores. Um, let's see, we have, we have another question from uh, Kurt, and he asks, are all guild mushrooms agarics? I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of terminology that I went over fairly, fairly quickly. And um, yeah, the agaric mushrooms are typically, are, are, are typically the guild mushrooms. 
Um, so that that's a that's a term that refers to the guild mushrooms. Yeah. Okay. So somebody was wondering about size reference, um, and the question came in when you were showing a photograph. I think of the the orange spindles. Right. Ah. Uh, so those those are probably um, again. I took that photograph and then didn't have any any uh, uh, ruler or anything in the photograph. Those are uh, maybe up to four or five inches in height. The golden spindles, yeah, but they're so colorful that it's hard to hard to miss them. All right, let's see. Next, we have a question from George Fields, our, our um, <laughs> newly revealed <laughs> photographer. <laughs> um, he asks, um, with the stink horns, um, let's see, insects are dispersing the spores at a greater level than windblown dispersal. You know, spore dispersal in mushrooms is an interest is is an interesting thing, and there are there are different mushrooms, George, that uh, that have different uh, that have different strategies for their dispersal. You saw that stinkhorn, which is definitely insect dispersed, and there are, there are others like that. I'd say most of the most of the mushrooms that I showed you pictures of are wind dispersed. The whole idea of having a, a a cap and a and a stalk is to get the spore producing surface up off the ground so that then the wind can disperse it and um, but the interesting thing about that is just a sidelight is that probably millions and millions of spores that are produced you, you know there may be a fraction of a fraction of a percent that are actually going to grow into something new. And that most of the overwintering that occurs in mushrooms, in mushroom fungi, occurs in the, in the um, mycelial state, underground vegetative state, rather than as spores. And so that allows us, for instance, to have mushrooms that come up in the same place over and over again, because they're there underground um, over the, over wintering and or for many years. Awesome. Thank you, David. We have somebody who's wondering about truffles that grow around here and if you might be able to talk about that. Okay, there are truffles that that uh, we can find in the forest and the best way to find them is to look where some squirrels or rodents have been scratching in the soil. They're the ones that can smell it and so if you are in a forest where you see uh, you know, obvious signs of squirrels or, or rodents scratching away at the soil surface, you might actually scratch away yourself in there and see if, see if there are any truffles. They're going to be pretty small and they're not going to be big and black and round like the, like the black truffles in France, but um, would, be, would be fairly um, sort of inconsequential, might in fact just look like a little pebble of some sort. And um, uh, they probably wouldn't have any odor that we could detect. And um, although I don't know of any that are poisonous, um, I wouldn't say that they would be terribly, uh, terribly uh, good to eat or terribly tasty to eat. It's curious that in other parts of the country, there are truffles that, that have been commercially uh, harvested there's a truffle in, in the southeast called a pecan truffle that has been discovered, oh, maybe 20 years ago that grows in association with pecan trees. And it's, being, it's, it's apparently um, quite, a, quite a good edible truffle. So uh, if, you're, if you're interested in truffles, look into cultivating um, a, uh, ash, not ash trees, hazelnut trees or oak trees that are pre-inoculated with truffles and then telling your grandchildren about it because it won't be, it'll be 35 years or so before you'll get anything produced in a truffle farm. <laughs> a good long-term project. <laughs> right. Um, let's see, we have a, a question from Joanne who asks, are there any symbiotic relationships of insects and mushrooms in Maine? Probably, I can't think of any right offhand, but I wouldn't want to say no. Um, I, uh, I'll have to, I'll have to give that some thought. Is that Joanne Sharp? Doesn't um, say. 
Joanne Romano. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so we have a few people who have raised their hands. So I think at this time, maybe I will um, unmute Linda. Um, and I know occasionally it's a mistake. Somebody accidentally raises their hand, but I'm going to um, allow you to talk, Linda, assuming that you raised it on purpose. <laughs> if you want to unmute. Yes. yes, I did raise my hand. I was wondering, you showed a picture or you talked about a pictures that someone had sent to you. Is it possible to send you pictures to identify <laughs> mushrooms or something? Linda, at the beginning, uh, there are quite a number of people that have that have participated in this talk, so I'm I'm opening myself up to a dangerous uh, thing here. But <laughs> there, at the beginning of the talk, I put my email on the uh, first slide, and um, it would be uh, perfectly all right if you wanted to send high quality, high resolution um, photographs that uh, show uh, the appropriate characteristics that I could, that I could possibly, um, that I could possibly, sorry, that I could possibly uh, try to identify. Yeah, I'm open to that. Okay, because I have a lot of trees around that are dead and I have two huge mushrooms growing on what kind of tree is that? Oh. No. Oh. The one that was blew down. Willow. No. In the middle of the driveway. <laughs> Beech elm. tree. Elm. elm tree. Elm. Elm tree. I was told that if mushrooms are growing on trees, then there's a possibility they would be edible. No. Don't, no. Go, don't go with that. There's no general rule about edible mushrooms. Okay. You have to know the individual mushroom and be able to identify that individual mushroom to determine whether it's edible. Okay. Here, let, let me, Linda, yes. let, me re, let me read you a limerick that relates to that. Here's a limerick that I just okay. recently came across. An arrogant fool from Muscungus claimed he knew everything about fungus. I need no advice. I eat what is nice. And now he is no longer among us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wouldn't just eat a mushroom, but I would like to know how to har harvest them. <clears throat> I just have an interest. I've never harvested, but I'm fascinated with oh, it. Good. I'm glad. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Um, so we have another hand up from JP, and you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Hi, I, I appreciate it. Um, I, I'm in Southern Maine and I've only been here for four years. I'm just getting into foraging and I love everything about mushrooms now, but um, the hardest part for me is uh, identifying mushrooms. You know, I, I've got a field guide with like a million mushrooms in there, but to narrow it down, uh, is challenging, especially like when, when this is so new to me and I'm doing it by myself. It, w would there be a couple mushrooms that you would say, you know, just learn everything about here in Maine that, that are edible? So when you go out, it's not a, a shoot in the dark as to what it is? Yeah, th there are, there are a, a number of uh, sort of sure edible mushrooms. I think that, that puffballs are one of them. I think that some of those... Uh, Hedgehog or spine producing mushrooms are another one that are that are really easy to identify and hard to mistake for anything else. Um, those are those are some examples um, of of things that that would be simple mushrooms to uh, to identify. But you know, JP, the the um, the probably the best way to learn about mushrooms is to go out with a group of people including some experts and there are various mushroom organizations mushroom uh, amateur uh, groups that have forays um, the main mycological association which will be referenced in the in the list that lander is going to send out is one such organization and that um, is one that i'm i have been associated with but uh, just spending time with people who know what they're doing in the in the woods hunting for things and i'm sure that in the 
in the Portland area um, and in other places. There are lots of people around. That would be my recommendation. Uh, <laughs> Um, as far as you're getting into uh, getting into uh, foraging for edible mushrooms. Yeah, I appreciate that. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Um, so I know we have lots of questions in the chat box and we have several more, four more hands raised. Um, we, we have about 10 more, more minutes that we could hang on if, if Tenley and David are interested and then um, the, the Zoom account I, will actually kind of close. <laughs> I have no problem. Okay, we'll, we'll keep going for a few more minutes then. Um, how about I unmute one more hand and then Tenley, do you wanna do a few questions in the chat box? We can kind of go back and forth. Um, so Anne, I noticed your hand is, hand is raised. So I'm gonna allow you to talk if you'd like to ask a question. I'm here. Okay. Um, I had a question about the uh, giant basketball size pup ball. Uh, we've only been up here a few years, but when we first came here, one appeared in our backyard, and it was a great excitement in the neighborhood. But we haven't seen one since. Now, I think you sort of, or not sort of, but did inform to me some ways it might have gotten there by the, uh, what was the words that you used, the, uh, whatever the words were about how they, the spores travel and so forth. Right. But now, how might we? discover where it traveled to since it left here. Hmm. But, and the thing about uh, all mushrooms, including the giant puffball that you talk about, is that uh, they may only come up um, once in a, in a decade or so. And uh, there's some mushrooms that, that come up every year in the same place, predictably. And there are others that uh, that you may not see for another uh, five or ten years, so it's a it's a kind of hit or miss uh, thing, and there's no no particular way that you would know whether that giant puffball was going to reappear or where it's going to reappear. I just keep looking in the place where you saw um, where you saw it at first, and also other areas uh, nearby. Uh, one of the things that could keep it from uh, reappearing. Maybe uh, if it's in a lawn area, maybe the, the introduction of, of uh, fungicides or pesticides on the lawn or over fertilizing the lawn, that sort of thing might inhibit the, might inhibit the uh, reappearance of the mushroom. Uh, but uh, I don't, there's no surefire way that you can predict when that's gonna, when that's gonna reappear. Thank you. I don't know that that was terribly helpful, but uh, I think it was. It's it the was. way it's the way things are. <laughs> I I find that um, I'm quite old, so I may not last till it comes back. <laughs> but uh, but I was hoping that the ch new children in the neighborhood might be able to get to see one. So we'll have there, to be there, there. You go vigilant. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. All right, um, should we switch back to the, the chat box questions? Um, so we have a question about chaga. Um, just a clarification, is chaga a um, but it says you refer to it as fungi light. Um, and then second question, have you found any morel? And if so, under what tree? There was a lot of interference when you were speaking. I couldn't completely hear, but I think you were asking that, that, that the question was asking about, about Chaga. I didn't understand the specifics of it. But, and the second half was about morels, which I've found, but just occasionally, you know, maybe one or two every year. Um, but as morels in this, part of the, in this part of the country seem to be most common under under dying elm trees for whatever reason. You know, in the Midwest, you find them in apple orchards. Um, and in the South, where I was before, you found them along stream, uh, stream beds. Um, and that, that isn't so much that the geography or that the mushrooms, that the morels behave differently in different geography, but rather that they're probably different species of morels, cryptic species, in fact. 
that all look alike, but uh, they grow in different associations. So what was the first part about shaga again? Um, is, it, is it considered a fungi? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a mushroom fungus. It produces a very obscure fruiting body. That is the mushroom part of it. It's just like a flat crust on the underside of the bark. And it only appears after the birch tree that it's been parasitized dies. And the shaga uh, sclerotium, it's called, the one that we're familiar with, is present on the live tree, but the actual mushroom, the fruiting structure, the spore producing structure, only occurs after the birch tree dies. Thank you. Thanks, David. So another question is, how, has the, how have the wildfires affected the mushroom population? In the West, I guess, is the, what the person is talking about. Uh, <clears throat> wildfires um, are a boon to mushroom collectors, particularly morel collectors. And there's, there are a lot of morels that come up uh, right after wildfires and the year, you know, maybe up to two years after wildfires. And you'll see, you'll see commercial mushroom collectors combing through uh, wildfire areas and, and plotting uh, strategies to go into these areas to collect morels. Again, different morels than what we have around here. Um, but I'm sure that wildfires, if it gets down into the soil very far, is going to kill the mycelium and therefore inhibit the growth of any of any mushrooms. But when 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 wildfires have passed through and the forest is regenerating, it's very significant to have the mushrooms and mushroom spores come and reestablish the mycorrhizal symbioses with the trees that are beginning to grow in those areas as well. So it's a very, it's a, it's a complicated ecosystem and uh, for wildfires are particularly the kind of intense fires that we're seeing in the West are going to have a profound effect on the, on the mycological por portion of the ecosystem. All right, we have a question from um, Connie who asks, are coral mushrooms edible? I never eat coral mushrooms. I once uh, prepared some that I thought were edible. Uh, this is a, something I shouldn't say. And I was cooking them and this was for a group of students and I was in a separate room cooking them. And while I was cooking them, that this is not true for all coral mushrooms, but it's just a cautionary note. While I was cooking them, there was this smell that was like some kind of uh, intense uh, creosote smell that uh, was coming from the mushrooms that I was cooking. I quickly uh, disposed of those mushrooms and told people that they were poisonous mushrooms and I never would have cooked them. Um, but uh, I, that may have, uh, that may have uh, influenced my lack of interest in coral mushrooms for the, for the kitchen, <laughs> and I haven't done much with them. There are some that are poisonous, and there are several that are edible or considered edible, but uh, I'll, I'll, le I'll leave it at that. <laughs> cool. Thanks, David. Um, so Joanne has her hand up, so I'm going to um, allow her to talk if she'd like. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, you know what? I was the one that was asking about the chaga and the and the morel, so you answered that question. But hang on, I was writing um, some things, and I, and also the insect and the symbiotic relationship. I was asking about that, um, but you said you would have to look into that. Was that? Yeah, I'd, I I can do that and send something to Lander, and she could send it out. I I'm I'm not familiar with a similar ant. Uh, fungus uh, interaction uh, symbiosis that's present in the, in the temperate forests. I know there are some leaf cutting ants or ants that cultivate fungi that are present in southern United States, right. um, but but I'm not familiar with anything in this part of the in this part of the country. That doesn't mean they don't exist. It's just is a a, a, a reflection of my own ignorance. <laughs> Thank you for answering my questions. And also, if you're in Southern Maine, it would be awesome if you offered a foraging class <laughs> when you're down here. As I mentioned to JP, there are, there are groups that are 
involved with mushroom foraging uh, in, in Southern Maine. And the main one that you might connect with is the Maine Mycological Association. And you can look them up on the web or um, there'll be a reference to that in the handout that, that Lander will send out. Yeah, thank you. I, I do belong to that. Oh, but sorry. It, no, that's okay. Thank you. But it would be, it's always interesting to have someone new. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. Okay, again. thanks, Joanne. Yep. Joanne, we have a couple more hands raised. Um, and I just got noticed that we can actually go another five minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. And then we will be shutting down. <laughs> Um, for another meeting that's going to happen on our Zoom account. Um, so we have a question from Atticus. We would like to ask your question. Um, you'll just have to unmute yourself. Um, and if it was a mistake of, putting up the little blue hand, that's okay too. Um, maybe I will, we'll come back to you. We have another hand raised um, from Deb. Deb, if you would like to ask your question and unmute yourself. <laughs> well, Kenley, well, why don't we move on to a chat box question for now? Okay. Um, let's see. This is from Kathy, and she asks, do my talky mushrooms generally come back in the same place each year? Um, she found some two years ago, but not last year. Good, good question. And uh, I've had the same experience. They do, they do definitely come back in the same location, and you can often go back to those same trees uh, year after year and some years you'll find them and some years you won't, but um, they're in there hiding, they're in there in the, in the tree, they're a, 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 a heart rot parasite of the trees, uh, and um, uh, they're typically found, as you probably know, with uh, uh, old red oak trees, although I have seen them on birch trees as well, which is sometimes a surprise. Um, but yes, keep your eyes open and don't tell anyone else where you're finding them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have another question in the chat box. Um, what impact does a dry season like this one typically have on the following year? And they also say thank you so much for this presentation. We've been getting a lot of thank yous and um, this, these have been an amazing presentation. So lots of praise. Good. Wow. <laughs> um, Now I, I was distracted by the your thank yous. So what was the question? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, what impact does a dry season like? Oh this yeah, sorry. Um, it, it's it's my ego that got in the way there. <laughs> um, the dry season is probably going to, of course, inhibit mushroom production this year. But in fact, in the subsequent years, it's likely to increase production because what they're doing is storing up nutrients. And what uh, mushroom mycelium needs is more stored nutrients for making more mushrooms. Um, so if the weather conditions are appropriate, the next year you'll often have, often have more mushrooms. Or you could have a couple of years which don't have many mushrooms and then you'll have a, a year where you get uh, an overabundance, yeah. All right, um, we have a question from Jesse who asks, uh, I think when is the best time, when is it best to harvest birch polypore for medicinal use? I, I'm not um, immediately familiar with harvesting it from, for medicine. <laughs> when is it good to harvest a cat? <laughs> um, Sorry about that. <laughs> The birch polypore is uh, probably best to harvest when it's young, maybe when the, when the uh, uh, tissue is still covering the pore layer. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wait until it's, uh, till it's older and they can last for a good long time as an old kind of a dried up mushroom on the birches. Um, 
but but you might refer to uh, some of the literature on that. Um, Greg Marley has a good book on medicinal mushrooms of uh, of the Northeast that I would that's in the list of references, and uh, he would be a good one to uh, consult with on that. Thank you, David. We're getting very, very close to, to time and we do have a bunch more questions. Um, David, if it's okay with you, I will put your email address in our follow-up email. Yeah. Um, so that if people still would like to ask you their questions that we haven't gotten to today, they can send you an email perhaps. That's fine. I'm retired. I don't have anything else to do. Oh, that's very kind of you <laughs> to offer your time. Um, and just, yeah, I just want to thank you so much again for joining us. It's been an absolutely delightful evening and I look forward to more collaborations in the future. Good. Well, I hope we can get out in the woods, uh, either as a group or certainly individually. Thanks absolutely. very much. And thanks everybody to tuned in and, uh, watched this production and thanks to both IHT and Blue Hill Heritage Trust for uh, sponsoring this. Okay. Thank you, David. Bye. Have a great day. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thank you, Tenley. Bye. Thank you.